All right, we're here for another episode. Uh, Dan Bentley here, and also I'm here with Tracy Newman. Today, what we're going to be talking to you about is how constraints can actually make you and your team more creative and innovative, which sounds kind of counterintuitive, but I, sh- I swear we've got some research and some some experience behind what we're talking about, so bear with us. Tracy is coming live from a new location this week. Tracy, where are you now? I mean, some people listen to the podcast, so you're going to have to give them a description, but for those that are watching the video can see, this is not where Tracy normally is. What's happened? No, that's right. I got rid of the camp chairs and the camp table and I'm using a a real live adult desk and I'm in my new place of abode. Uh, I've relocated back to Adelaide from Sydney. So I get to spend a bit more time with the family now, which is exciting. Yeah, it's awesome. Did a runner. I've been hearing the up to, you know, week by week, day by day, (laughs) minute by minute um, challenges, I guess, that you faced trying to get SA Health to let you back into your home state after being in Sydney for almost about a year, I think it was, but you were the, obviously with the situation there, it's been quite tricky. And the reason why SA has been able to have so little cases has been because they have been so stringent, but unfortunately it's pretty hard for some people to get home. So you're there now. It's awesome. Um, you know, hopefully enjoying some lovely Adelaide weather and some company and some freedom. So happy days. Uh, we quarantined at home for the first two weeks, which was really nice because we had the SES or police come to visit us each day. Uh, there was a couple of times there where I was actually doing a webinar and they, they came around to do the check. So they were actually uh, waving to me through the window. So um, that's all over now. So I won't be getting any uh, momentary stops where I need to wave to someone out of the window. So you have my full attention too. Nice. You're free. Hmm. All right. So... This topic today, constraints and creativity, a lot of people think that those things are at odds. They think that that is one side, two different sides of the same coin. You know, they're thinking at the end of the day, I don't want constraints. I want blue sky thinking. I want big ideas. I want innovation. Let's talk about this. Why why can they work well together? Uh, it's so counterintuitive, isn't it? You know, when you talk about innovation, people start thinking about sending rockets to the moon, um, whereas, you know, with, with the work that we do, when we go somewhere and people are like, oh, well, it's very hard to be innovative in our sector because we have a lot of restrictions, you and I are like, yes, <laughs> because we we see all the time that those restrictions actually facilitate creativity because if you've got lots of money and lots of time, it's really easy just to sort of get a bit lazy and just kind of do what you've always done and follow the sort of well-trodden path. Whereas if you have some, you know, what seem like really difficult constraints, you actually need to be creative to, to design around them. So those constraints actually really are very helpful for creativity. Yeah. So there's some science behind this. I mean, we've got a few examples which we'll share with you, some organizations we've worked with, but there is some science and some research, a lot of really good research around how this works. And, you know, the crux of it is, is that when people are trying to think blue sky, like there is also the element of the, you know, change comes out of necessity, which we talk about a lot, which is what Tracy was talking about. But there's also the thing is as well, that when you give somebody unlimited I guess, like blue sky sort of thinking where it's like you can do absolutely anything. It can actually be quite crippling for people. They can be like, I don't know where to get started. I don't have any direction. There's a lot of those sorts of things. Giving people some constraints and a space to operate in and work in actually helps them to be able to be focused and also it gives them some rules to play the game within, right? So what this actually does for people when they have these rules is they have to start thinking, well, how could I get around that? How could I... um, how could I make this better? Or if I've only got, you know, a year to get this thing done, what decisions would I make? And when they think through and they get to that level of, um, I guess, thinking and, and, and have that structure around it, they get better ideas because they've had to think through to that level. Whereas sometimes, like we said before, when you've got this whole big, you can kind of do anything, well, then people kind of do anything <laughs> and it doesn't necessarily come up with the best outcome. Um, so yeah, this is really good article that uh, we've referenced, Trace, so you've, you've probably read it a few more times than I have because it was yours and you found it, but it might be worth just going into some of the, the stats of what they found during this article around the, the research that they did into this particular phenomenon. phenomenon. Yeah, sure, exactly. yeah. I mean, um, exactly. Like, like we're really excited about constraints and innovation, but, you know, it's 
really helpful when you can go to somewhere like the Harvest, Harvard Business Review and they've actually done studies on 145 different studies all about the effects of constraints on creativity and they've actually found that often projects are successful not despite constraints but because of constraints and you know, whilst it's all well and good for Dan and I to say, yeah, we see that, you know, bear with us. It's it's actually really exciting when you can look at data like that and and share that broadly and say, well, it's not just an opinion. <laughs> this is this is a lot of studies that have been conducted over, uh, you know, a very wide breadth of industries and they all support that constraints actually do facilitate creativity. And um, they actually referenced one in particular, which I really love, uh, which is all uh, about GE. So they were um, a group of engineers were tasked with creating um, an ECG machine, which needed to be available uh and used in the rural area. So it had quite a lot of constraints. It needed to be light. It needed to be um, cost no more than a dollar per scan. There was quite a lot of restrictions in terms of the, the actual product. Um, but the other two restrictions that were really important was it needed to be done within 18 months and the budget was half a million dollars, whereas the previous version, they spent $5.4 million. So it's quite a significant difference in terms of both time and cost. And in the study where they referenced this, they actually said that it was successful not despite the constraints, but it was successful because of these constraints, because it got the engineers to think really creatively about how they were going to, you know, really flip flip the creation of a device on its head rather than just doing the things that they've always done because that's what they know is already successful. Yeah, that's, that's a great example, isn't it? And we've seen this in the sector too. Um, let's talk a little bit about our experience with that. We, we do a lot of work in aged care, as people know. We talk about that a lot. And uh, yeah, we Tracy's been doing some work in particular with um, a bunch of um, aged care in-home service providers. And the aged care standards, when we started these projects, we were told, oh, look, you know, these people, we all want to be innovative, but the the bloody aged care standards, they get in the way <laughs> and they, they make it hard for us to do our job. And, and like, we get that, we get that. Don't, don't, don't take me wrong. Don't take it the wrong way. But it was interesting when we started working with them and we actually, you know, as Tracy said before was we're like, Oh, okay, well, this is not a bad thing. We, we think this might actually be really helpful for you guys. And we, we helped them to sort of use those, aged care standards as design principles, which we'll talk a little bit more around what they are in a sec. But yeah, Tracy, yeah, take us through like some of the stories of what you found when you were able to get them to look at these constraints as enablers rather than um, disablers that get in the way. Yeah. And look, the other constraints that you hear a lot in this sector um, is all about time. Uh, so the people that I'm working with quite often have, uh, you know, a high amount of tasks that they need to do every day. So when, again, when you're talking about being innovative and, and creating better services, they're like, well, you know, we have constraints, we have to do things a certain way, plus we don't have a lot of time to dedicate to this project and, um, you know, we, we also have other sort of things that, that are in the pipeline, you know, following Royal Commissions, et cetera. So they were, they were definitely of the mindset that they had a lot of restrictions that would get in the way of their creativity. However, as we actually went through the, the program, what they found was, yes, those constraints were actually really helpful because it, it works as an anchoring point. So when you've got 100 ideas if you can filter those through uh, the, the anchoring point, which is essentially what a design principle is, it, it then helps you to go, okay, well, can I attach this solution to one of the aged care standards, which is something that, that as an organisation we need to demonstrate that we work in line with. And if if they're not able to, well, then they're, they're very quickly and easily able to say, well, that's really not going to help move our our organisation forward so we can sort of discard that idea. It really helps in terms of filtering out those great ideas to pr progress with. Um, but it also helps even in the first place where, um, you know, consumer dignity and choice is is a... Uh, um, is, is one of those things that you could look at it and say, well, that, you know, that's a massive uh, 
things to be able to provide and you know, how do you make that tangible? And then when you actually start thinking about, okay, well, how do you make it tangible and really bring it to life and actually include your consumer in creating things and, and really give them a bigger say, it actually really changed their mindset around, okay, so this isn't about working out how to work you know, within the aged care standards. This is actually about using the aged care standards to reimagine the way that we work and get better outcomes. I think that story of the the mealtime project that somebody had was a good example of that, wasn't it, from memory? It's a fantastic example. Yeah. Because, um, and, you know, we hear like all the time food is such an important part of, of older people um, feeling you know, for, for their quality of life, you know, uh, I know I, I start thinking about dinner when I get up in the morning. So it doesn't surprise me at all that other people are really um, excited to think about food and, and the part that that pay, plays in their life. But if you're, you know, in, in a home and somebody's telling you that you're not allowed to have poached eggs because it could have salmonella in it, like that's really, you know, it, it's, it's actually really disappointing for people. You know, they feel like they don't get to make choices about their own life and, and their own risk-taking. Um, and so it comes from a good place. You know, the, the home wants to make sure that their their uh, consumers are safe. But from, you know, the consumer's perspective, you know, when we did that interview, there was just a lady and she was like, I, I just want to be able to eat a soft-boiled egg. And it was just heartbreaking to think that she she wasn't able to make even just a small fundamental decision like that in her life. So when they actually um, reimagined that and then said, okay, well, there are some risks, um, but let's actually make our consumers aware of what those risks are and let's let them make those choices and, and take those risks for themselves um, with full knowledge of, you know, what those risks are. So, and I think how that linked back to the aged care standards was all about the consumer dignity, consumer dignity and choice element of those standards was kind of the catalyst for them to start looking at the mealtime experience. And they were able to use that as, okay, we want to provide people with a good experience and we also want to keep them safe, but how could we kind of provide that consumer dignity and, and choice in a way that's still going to be safe. And so they were the constraints and then that was the solution of, well, maybe, you know, we can, if we look at that from a risk perspective, it's not that risky and maybe there are ways we can give people a choice in what they eat but also keep them safe at the same time. I think that's how it kind of works. Is that right? Absolutely. And, you know, the great news is they were able to get lots of different areas working together. So, you know, uh, your occupational therapists were able to advise on, you know, choking hazards and things like that and, and how you can work effectively with them. So it's actually... Uh, again, if if you didn't have that restriction and that mandate, you, you, it's it's not as easy to get everybody together to work on a, a really creative and interesting solution. Whereas having that, you know, um, I guess being a, being required to evidence how you're actually bringing the standards to life was really instrumental in that catalyst for change. Yeah, nice, awesome. Uh, so yeah, and look. You, know, you might be sitting there going, but I don't work in aged care. I don't have the aged care standards. But every sector has their own constraints. You know, if you're in disability, you've got a number of different governance type elements and um, regulations that you need to follow. Healthcare, obviously the same. They're all highly regulated spaces. And even if you don't work in any of those particular parts of the sector, you, you even have organisational and also requirements from people that you work with um, that, 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 that exist. And so it's about collecting those I think, to be able to create what we call the design principles. So let, let's maybe segue into that now. Let's talk design principles and, and what they are. So essentially what they are is when you, you're going to run a project, an innovation project, and you get started, the first thing you want to do whilst you're you know, framing the problem and understanding you know, what, what you're trying to achieve and aligning in your, your people and building your team and all those different things you're doing, one of the key things you want to do is understand like what are the design principles that we're going to run with here. And essentially what design principles are is they're kind of your guide rails to your creativity. So when we talk about constraints, this is where you want to put your constraints. And there's a whole heap of stuff online um, that you can, you can look into if you want to know more about it. But essentially you use this as a way to keep people on track. So any of those constraints, any of the things that you know you must achieve as part of this project, 
is you have them in the design principles. And essentially what happens is as you're going through the innovation process, you keep referring to those design principles to make sure that you're um, that you're staying on that on that track the entire time. Because as you know, it can be very easy to go off track. So these design principles will keep you on track, make sure that what you are creating is actually going to be what you need it to be by the time you get to the end. Do you want anything else to that, Trace? No, um, that's you've covered that really well. Uh, so I, there's something else from the article that I thought was quite interesting. They actually um, have three different ways, I guess, you can bring in constraints on your projects. So I thought we could go through those. Um, by the way, we're going to put this article in the show notes too. So if you do want to read the whole thing, go nuts. It, it'll be there for you. So number one, the first way you can um, put constraints into your innovation work is that you can limit inputs. So you can look at things like time, you know, how many people are going to be allowed to be involved or who it's for, um, funding, um, materials that they can use, all sorts of things like that. So limiting those inputs can be a really easy way to, to, to give people a constraint that's helpful for them. I guess when we think about some of the projects that we work on, that a lot of the time comes down to time and, and, and funding is what we find. So it might be like, you know, we want to create this amazing program or we want to create this amazing service, but the constraint that the organisation will co- often put on that will be, but it needs to be something we can deliver and operationalise within six months. Or we need to create this amazing service or we need to improve our current service, but we can't spend more than X amount. So that's where that can kind of practically look. Hmm. Yeah, I've got another really great example of um, how a constraint actually led to a a much better outcome. So uh, doing some work, um, again, you know, um, with older people, and we're actually having a look at transport for people to get to senior citizen club meetings. And um, one of the, uh, I guess, one of the um, constraints was that, that, um, the council wasn't going to provide a dedicated bus. So they weren't going to um, be able to, to do that. They had done it previously and in terms of cost and, and benefit, it was agreed that that wasn't going to be part of the project moving forward. And because that was taken off of the table, it actually led to investigation as to, you know, what, what are some of the other alternatives? And in investigating those other alternatives, it was identified that when you were speaking to people who weren't going to those senior citizen club meetings, it actually wasn't transport that was the issue at all. So having that restriction actually enabled them to get to, well, what was the real cause of the, the concern and what was actually really getting in the way of attending of people attending those meetings rather than, you know, I guess just throwing money at it and providing a bus service that, that potentially wasn't going to be used. Mm, how interesting. Mm. Good exa- yeah, that's, that's a really interesting example. Um, yeah, so that's the first, inputs. The second is mm-hmm. you can enforce specific processes. Enforce, strong language, HBR. Mm, um, it is. Implement. You can implement <laughs> specific processes. Uh, so examples could include procedures on seeking early market and technological feedback. So using like the lean startup model or you could use like human-centered design or co-design. So, you know, often we see things like that and we do this sort of work where we say, look, you know, you want to, we want you to create this solution, but it must be co-designed with all of the stakeholders. That's an example of enforcing a specific process to ensure that what you create has been done in a certain way and has some constraints to make sure that you're going to get a particular outcome, not just any outcome. Yeah, because we are great proponents of collaboration and we see that as being really integral to, you know, quality innovation um, and, you know, therefore using things like human-centred design and co-design. But the other method that we always talk about, uh, which is part of those, is actually testing. So rather than, you know, going from creation to launch, spend that time testing. And that, that I guess, is a, another example of where we say to people, you know, before you actually press the go button, make sure that you're testing it, even though you've sort of gone through the process right up to that point and it has been really collaborative because it's easy to, you know, just shift three degrees off of your mark and end up 
with a with a product or a program that really isn't going to meet people's needs and you want to know about about that before you invest a lot of money in in go live mm. yeah that makes sense and finally the third element that you can implement or enforce um, is that you can set specific output requirements such as a product or service specification. So the example that they use here is that um, Apple's design chief, Jonathan Ive, um, has, was known to have imposed the use of scratch resistance aluminosilicate glass uh, during the design of the iPhone 4. So he would have essentially said something along the lines of, we want you to make another iPhone, but... The constraint is you need to work out a way to put this special glass <laughs> on top of <laughs> as the screen. So all of those teams, that the engineers and the designers would have had to go, wow, okay, this is this constraint. Like how are we going to be able to build that in and also still keep it lightweight and how are we going to still keep it looking chic and slick and all those sorts of things and how are we also going to keep it within the cost bracket that we've got as a budget. You can see how when you have something like that, then – that it just gets everybody to start thinking, how can we, how can we, how can we sort of questions. And, you know, Mm. the thing is as well, like there must have been a good reason why he thought that was a great thing. Maybe he had an insight after speaking to a lot of consumers that that's what they wanted, but they didn't know that's what they wanted. Like maybe they were getting a lot of returns of the iPhones because they were just constantly getting scratched. And he thought, well, if we can nail this particular thing as part of the design of this next release, then we're going to be able to change the game for our consumers and our customers. Yeah. I mean, our clients, whilst they're not designing phones, we often see those restrictions, particularly if we're doing work where um, an organisation has been successful in applying for a grant. So, you know, the, in the grant application process, they've needed to identify what it is that they're looking to create and the parameters around that. So those, you know, that sort of grant guideline then becomes that sort of product or, um, you know, that that guide rail that we use in in that instance. So, you know, when we created visibility, there there was a grant, we knew that it needed to be, you know, training, we knew that it needed to be, uh, you know, what, what I guess the topic of that training was, but the process that we went through to actually create it really fleshed that out in terms of, you know, what is it um, going to look like um, and what are the things that we need to make sure are included in the training for it to be really effective and how do we involve the the prospective clients who are actually going to go through that training in the design within those constraints. Yeah, Yeah, all right. So there you have it, guys. There's a number of different uh, ways you can implement constraints and I hope we've been able to sort of help you understand just how helpful these things can be. You know, a lot of stuff with innovation or anything in this sort of space really is is about your mindset and how you approach things. And I think starting to get your team to look at your constraints as enablers can just be a really big way to start turning people's mindsets away from here's what we can do rather than here's what we can't do. And I think that's just such an important part of innovation is getting people out of that, you know, managing the status quo, thinking about what they can't do and into let's come up with solutions and let's work out a way forward because you know what at the end of the day there always is a way forward uh it may not be the perfect thing but there's always something that you can do that is better and is going to improve so this sort of thing should hopefully help with that so yeah we'll put that article into the show notes so you can have a bit of a read of it and yeah we hope that this conversation was helpful so thanks so much for for listening and uh we'll see you on the next one cheers thanks guys thanks Dan.